There are many divisive views on the game Skyward Sword. Whether you like the game or not, whether you preferred a good story over an open world, or whether you like the motion controls, or you just plain suck at the game. But one thing is for certain that we can all agree on is the fact that Skyward Sword had some of the best dungeons in the entire series, and they were a treat to play through. This list kind of bothered me to put together, because as I got down to the bottom, I found that they are all dungeons I still enjoyed, and it upset me that they were low on this list. But then I thought to myself, wait a minute, is this really such a bad problem to have? It certainly beats the opposite scenario. This is the only dungeon on this list that I don't care for too much, and even it is still pretty fun to do. I have no idea why, but I'm typically not a fire level kind of guy. They just never really stick with me. However, the Earth Temple does have some redeeming qualities that make it a memorable dungeon. Like rolling on that giant stone ball over a thin pathway of lava, or the Indiana Jones downhill run to get away with the boss key. Even the Magmas play a great role in this dungeon, providing some extra story, and of course, Led's Bombay. Now normally bombs are kind of a generic item in the Zelda franchise, but the ability to throw a place and even roll them on the ground makes great use of the bombs in a lot of ways that we haven't seen before. I especially like how you can restock your bomb bag just by harvesting the little suckers. Now you don't have to buy them. The mini boss of this dungeon is kind of forgettable, but being as it is the early stages of the game, it makes sense for it to be two Lizalfos, as they are typically not encountered yet on your journey. The main boss, Scaldera, however, is quite memorable and is a nice way to finish off this dungeon. Like I said before, fire dungeons aren't my bag, baby. But this one felt different. Every other fire dungeon in the series is dark, dingy, and has this sick fetish to have some sort of lava or fire in just about every camera shot, just to remind you that it's a fire dungeon. But not the fire sanctuary. It's a place where the fire takes a backseat role. Sure, you have some dingy areas where the air is hot and fuzzy, but every time you go out into the outside area, and you see the sky above you, it's literally a breath of fresh air. And to me, the way the inside-outside dungeon feels, combined with the water plants and beautiful artwork spread across this place, makes the fire sanctuary feel different than your typical fire-based level. There are nice touches everywhere in this dungeon, like using the water plants to quench the thirst of the frog statues, even skydiving off the bridge of decision into the frog's mouth. Additionally, the ability to go underground with the help of the magma mitts is a nice new perspective and a very creative way to solve some puzzles and get around. Even older items like the gust bellows found a use in this place by cooling the lava clumps on the ground. What, you want another nice touch? Oh, okay. How about the bird statue that's inside this dungeon that can actually access the sky? Simply amazing. From the moment you walk into the Lanayru mining facility, you think, oh, a sand dungeon. Sand dungeons are cool. A little bland, but that's to be expected from a sand dungeon. That actually makes sense. Then you hit a time shift stone and the entire place jumps to life. The conveyor belts start to move, lasers turn on, and the music pumps up. Now we're talking. This level is like a two for one pizza special. On the one pizza you have pathways hidden under the sand and artifacts that survive the test of time and on the other pizza, you have ancient technologies and pathways that decayed or disappeared over the years, but would have been helpful in their prime. 
Luckily for you, they are both tied together by a simple time shift stone. One of the coolest mechanics I've ever seen not only in the Zelda series, but any game I've ever played. The ability to traverse through time to solve puzzles is ingenious. This is like the entire game of Ocarina of Time in one single dungeon. The Gust Bellows is put to good use in this level by ridding all the sand that has accumulated over the years. But strangely, there is no mini-boss guarding it, or in this dungeon at all. You could argue the Armo statues are mini-bosses, but they show up too much throughout the mining facility and just have regular enemy music to accompany them. But that's okay, because the Thousand Year Arachnid Molderac more than makes up for it. This place is like a combo of all the fun good stuff from all the other dungeons, all piled into one last test to see if you are worthy of the Triforce. Revisiting the themes of earlier levels is a nice way to wrap up the story and provide a good challenge by combining some of the puzzles and items that you wouldn't have had earlier, but now that you are fully equipped, it isn't a problem. I enjoyed how you can manipulate the very temple structure itself to navigate between the rooms. My only complaint about this place is that the dungeon theme is only in the main room and the Triforce rooms. I kind of wish it was more prevalent in this temple, but then again if it was, would it take away from the sacredness feeling it had to it? Overall though, it's a very minor complaint. This temple is nothing short of incredible. It may be the first dungeon in the game, but man did it leave some memories. The atmosphere and theme that went along with it was simply beautiful, yet mysterious at the same time. The main room where you can see the sky with the light coming down will leave your jaw hanging in awe. This temple just felt special, like it was important somehow, more so than the other temples in this game. It had this vibe to it that I can't really explain, but I wish I knew more about. It's a very intriguing place, just like the Eye Guardians that lock the doors. I like how you have to make them dizzy and pass out in order to get through. And the more valuable treasure, the more eyes there is to guard it. The dungeon item, the beetle, was very strange to see at first, but extremely fun to use, especially once you've upgraded a few times. It's actually quite satisfying to torment the Bokovins with it as they run away in fear as you chase them. But that torment comes back to bite you in the boss fight with Yuri. Or lick you. I'm not sure. When I walked into the Ancient Cistern, something felt different. Most dungeons, even the ones that are pretty, end up having an unsettling vibe to them of some sort. Whether it's the music tone, or the fact that the dungeon is falling apart over time. The Ancient Cistern, on the other hand, despite its name, is seemingly brand new. Nothing in it is broken or out of place, except for the grass growing on the stone walkways. And the music is so peaceful, you question if you are really in a dungeon. This temple also introduces the combination door locks that require clues that are hidden somewhere in the temple to decode, which is a great mechanic that I'd love to see in the future Zelda games. Another great aspect of this place is the underground basement area, being the complete opposite of the upstairs part. There is our creepy unsettling dungeon aspect, complete with cursed water and undead vocal bins that are very difficult to kill without a final blow, and even a music change to further emphasize the dark atmosphere. I really appreciate the small detail of the undead vocal bins being afraid of the holy light from your sacred shield, 
or a powered up Skyward Strike, which I only recently found out this last playthrough. Pretty cool. Toss in the whip as the dungeon item that allows you to steal from enemies and turn on valves, and we have some fun puzzles to solve. It's put to excellent use in the boss fight too. A fantastic way to finish off this awesome temple. What's better than a pirate ship? A pirate ship piloted by robots, that can sail on water and sand, and can go invisible, and traverse through time. Stop me when this dungeon gets amazing. Oh! Oh, you wanted me to stop at the pirate ship. Seriously, I'm not sure how you can top this dungeon. You have to retake the ship from the pirate robot by having a sword fight with him on the bow of the ship and forcing him to walk the plank. After you are through with him, you have to restart the engines and free the trapped crew, and on top of all that, you have a wicked boss fight with the giant leviathan Tentalus. This dungeon also casually throws in the hero's bow as the item, and after using the slingshot as your projectile weapon for most of the game, it's nice to finally get upgraded to the more powerful bow. Even the music in this place has four different variations, depending on if you're outside, inside, in the past, or the present. They went all out on this dungeon. Just take a look at the view from atop the ship. Just breathtaking. This has been Moss, and you may have noticed that I didn't go into too much detail on the bosses of each dungeon, and that was clearly by design. The bosses are significant enough to get their own ranking video sometime in the future, so in the meantime and in between time, stay tuned for more.